Welcome everyone to this virtual se uh, session of the Library Instruction Tennessee Conference. The Library Instruction Tennessee provides space for teaching librarians to network, collaborate, and discuss trends, issues, and innovations in library instruction and information literacy. We would like to thank the Citadel Library for providing Zoom access for our conference. This meeting is being recorded. By continuing to attend this session, you are consenting to being part of the recording. These recordings with captions will be posted on the LIP website after the conference. We ask all attendees to abide by our code of conduct, which may be found on the About Us page of the LIP website. If you'd like to report an issue, please email us at libraryinstructiontn at gmail.com. We have disabled your microphones, so if you have questions for the speakers during this session, please place them in the chat box and the speakers will address them or we'll include them in our Q&A period at the end. If you have any technical issues, again, please email libraryinstructiontn at gmail.com. A survey will be emailed to you after the conference concludes. Please give us feedback as we will use that to improve your experience. And this session that we are in today is Reflect and Connect creating an online teaching challenge for instruction librarians. And our presenters are Courtney Eager and Caitlin Shanley of Temple University Libraries. So now I'm gonna turn it over to them and let's get lit. I love that. Thank you so much for having us. Welcome to Reflect and Connect. We love a good rhyme or um, alliteration here at Temple. So we hope you're ready for this presentation. My name is Courtney Eager, and I am the Learning and Engagement Librarian at the Ginsburg Health Sciences Library at Temple University. You can find me at Twitter at LibCourtneyEager, and with me is Caitlin. Hey everyone, I'm Caitlin Shanley. I'm the Coordinator of Learning and Student Success at the Charles Library, which is our main campus library in Philadelphia. Um, I did want to do a quick Tennessee shout out. I used to be a Tennessee librarian myself. I worked at UTC uh, for about two and a half years. It was my first job out of library school and I just have nothing but love for my colleagues there. Um, I really loved working there. Um, but now I'm in Philadelphia uh, at Temple University. Just some quick facts that you might want to know about Temple as we get started. Um, Temple's an R1. It's a public university. We're located in Philadelphia. We have a few campuses, um, some in the city. The health sciences campuses and main campus are in the city. We have a suburban campus, and we even have two international campuses. We have about 37,000 students, so pretty big. Um, and they're about 70% in-state students, so mostly kind of regional. A lot of uh, Philadelphia students uh, come to Temple. So just wanted to give a little bit of kind of background about the institution where we work. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, this is kind of our brief outline. So first, we're going to go over just kind of the background, why we decided to do a teaching challenge. Then we'll share with you the details. What did we actually do for the challenge? And then next steps, what will we do with what we learned? So we'll start with the background. So why did we decide to do a teaching challenge? So one reason is because pandemic. So I have a, here a screenshot from uh, Yoga with Adrian, which is a free uh, YouTube series, yoga series. So like many other people during the pandemic, um, I was looking for something to do. One of the things I started doing was using these Yoga with Adrian videos to learn yoga. I didn't really ever do yoga before, so it was new to me. And I thought it was really fascinating that she does all these kind of 30 days of yoga series. Um, that kind of 30 day challenge format really worked for me, um, a person who didn't do yoga and sometimes struggles to stick to habits. So I was sort of inspired by this and thought it might be cool to see how we could use this idea to get our colleagues motivated to do new things. Um, so that kind of planted, yeah, so other, you see we've got other fans here. Um, it's, it's great, amazing, I, I totally recommend it. Um, so that kind of planted the seed for the format that we wanted to try out for the challenge. Um, before we get into kind of the nitty gritty though, I just want to sort of set the stage about um, our organization and how this initiative fits in to our work. 
All right, so this is a nice, uh, simple organization chart. So a few years back, we did the whole library reorganization thing. Um, it's probably familiar to some of you. Um, this is not actually the org chart that we ended up with. This is a, a draft uh, of um, a potential new structure uh, as we were kind of going through that reorganization process. So basically, our administration wanted to uh, change our structure to reflect that research and instruction librarians have both that subject expertise, so kind of that top left corner of this diagram that has arts and humanities, business, social sciences, um, uh, sciences and medicine, but then we also have these functional areas. So we work in things like scholarly communications, instruction, outreach, that kind of thing. Um, so one aspect of this reorganization is that Temple University Libraries formed what we call strategic steering teams. And these are cross-departmental teams that are focused around different areas of our kind of strategic directions. Um, so this diagram's a little busy. Let's pare it down a little bit and focus on just the teams aspect uh, of the organization. So we formed five teams um, kind of around these strategic areas. So they ended up being that research and scholarly services one kind of morphed into more of a data services team. We have outreach and communications, scholarly communications and publishing, collections management, and then finally our team that Courtney and I are on, which is learning and student success. Um, so the way these teams work, they're designed to be cross-departmental. So every year in the spring, there is a, a call for membership. Anyone in the libraries and press is, um, is welcome to volunteer, kind of regardless of their job role. Um, so because our administration has said, these are areas we need to really build up, supervisors are encouraged to make changes to people's work to allow them to be on these teams. Um, they're, they're designed to be autonomous. So an interesting part of this process is that we actually developed our own charge. Um, we were kind of given an area to work in, but we're given autonomy to say sort of what that means for us. Um, we could decide things like how we make decisions, like are we going to use consensus? Are we going to vote on things? Um, we have the autonomy to set priorities and goals each year. And then one of the last kind of guiding principles for the teams is that they're supposed to be flat. Um, I put that in quotation marks because I think this one um, is a little ambitious. So what, what was intended by that is that um, the teams are, are not supposed to be hierarchical. Um, so when possible, we were trying to kind of avoid having supervisors and supervisees on the teams, but it's just, you can't really make that happen in an organization. The hierarchy still exists and is real. Um, so I would say we strive to have greater opportunities for people to participate. Um, we try to be as flat as possible, but in my opinion, we can never be truly sort of flat. Um, but that's kind of one of the, uh, the values of the teams is trying not to just replicate the hierarchy that already exists in the organization and sharing work equally among all the members. Great, so let's zoom in even more and look at just our team. Um, so our team's name, our full name is the Learning and Student Success Strategic Steering Team. So that is L-S-S-S-S-T. Uh, so personally, I have started calling it LIST just because I think that's a little easier. Uh, four S's is, is a lot. Um, so I call it LIST. Um, so as sort of this new kind of cross-departmental team, we faced some unique challenges and also opportunities. It's one of these situations that I kind of describe as we, we had a lot of responsibility, but not necessarily a lot of authority. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ways that we enabled the work of the team. So first is meetings. Um, so for some of us, like me and Courtney, instruction is like part of our job title. It's one of, it's like our main role. For others, this is kind of something extra that they're doing. Instruction might be just one small part of their job. It might not even be part of their job job at all. 
Um, so it's, it can be really easy to have the work of the team get pushed to the back burner. One way that we try to remedy that is by having regular bi-weekly meetings. So we meet twice a month um, and a lot of our work has been completely online, meeting only online since March 2020. When we first formed, um, we wanted to kind of work together on our values. So what are the shared values around teaching and learning that we have as a group? What is important to us? So we came up uh, with a list of these values, things like recognizing the both visible and invisible labor that goes into instruction, ideas about building peer support networks, um, we wanted to approach assessment in ways that help us improve our teaching, but don't compromise student privacy, things like that. We wanted to articulate what our values were. Using that, we, we kind of wrote out our vision. So with these values in mind, how can that inform the direction of where we want to go? Um, and that is sort of, those are documents that help us to create our yearly goals, thinking about kind of how we want to move forward. And then last, our membership, thinking about who should be at the table. So being open to all staff is a great opportunity to get a real variety of perspectives about teaching and learning. Uh, so our current members, we have 11 members right now. Um, we have folks from learning and research services. So that's both librarians and also our library instructional designer is on the team. Someone from our satellite campus uh, in the suburbs in Ambler, PA folks from health sciences libraries, from special collections, and even from the law library. Um, and we are proud uh, to be within these teams. We're the only one that actually has a, uh, a team member who's not from the library. So the assistant director of the writing center is a member of our team, and her perspective has just been immensely uh, helpful to get us kind of out of our library mode and thinking a little bigger. Right. So in February 2021, we kind of revisited our goals for that year and noticed that there was one that we kind of hadn't, hadn't really addressed yet. Um, so we had said at the beginning of the year we wanted to explore methods for improving our teaching, such as structured self-reflection or peer observation. So one idea that's been kicked around for a few years at Temple is the idea of having uh, peer feedback for teaching, which is a great idea, but we were, I think a little, we wanted to kind of ease into that a little bit more. Um, I think people were feeling particularly vulnerable during the pandemic, being like, okay, now someone's gonna watch you teach. It just wasn't the right timing. So we decided instead to kind of start with the idea of reflective practice, of, of self-reflection and use that as the foundation for improving our teaching. Um, as we were thinking about this goal, we were also kind of talking about the idea of having a Canvas site for our group, um, something where if somebody went to a conference and they saw a really great presentation, they could share it with colleagues there, just somewhere where we could like talk about teaching and learning with each other. So we realized we could kind of combine these ideas into one initiative. And that was sort of where we started thinking about turning this into a teaching challenge. So kind of our ultimate goals were reflection, building in reflective practice, um, learning new things, we wanted that kind of time delimited aspect to hopefully help motivate people. And then last, we wanted to try to, as much as we could, build community, um, sharing, kind of building a community of practice. So a couple of considerations before we dove in, as we kept brainstorming, some of the questions we had were about timing. So when's the right time to do this challenge? Initially, we were thinking it would have been great to do it kind of during the semester when people were actively teaching so that they could do things like journal about a class right after it happened. Um, but ultimately, we decided to do it in the middle of summer so that people had um, kind of more open schedules, less uh, scheduled things so that they would hopefully have more time to participate. What incentives could we offer people to participate? Um, so we ultimately couldn't get funding to do this project. Um, I think I've heard a couple mentions of budget cuts and, you know, budget uh, shortages during the pandemic. So we did face that. Our, our administration thought it was a good idea, but they weren't able to give us funding to do it. So when thinking about incentives, 
we had to think about things that we could achieve with the resources that were already in place. So we were thinking of things like make, people could get a shout out in the Slack newsletter. Um, we could maybe just get one prize and raffle off uh, tickets for it. Um, we could, and what we ultimately ended up doing, we could print, uh, 3D print things in our in-house maker spaces that we have in each of our libraries. The format, so should it be purely asynchronous so that people could really work on their own timelines, kind of like an online course, or should we have some kind of live Zoom forum where people could talk face to face? And then the last consideration was burnout, something that we've talked a little bit about at this conference. So should we really be asking people to do one more thing at this point during the pandemic? Um, so we really wanted to make it an opportunity to connect with each other, not just sort of more work. So over the next couple months, um, our team started contributing ideas to a brainstorming document. And then Courtney and I really took the lead and ended up doing a lot of the, of the work to create the, the structure, the details of the challenge. And so we're showing you this guy. This guy became our unofficial mascot of the challenge. Um, and this was our little meme that we shared throughout the challenge period. So we're showing him to you and we're gonna get ready and do this. Let's talk about the details. You want the details of the challenge, right? You know, what did we do? So here's how it was structured. The program ran in July of 2021. It was completely online and it was housed in that Canvas course that we had already created. So each Monday, a new module would open for the week. We would ask that all final work be kind of due by the end of the week, but really everything all together was due about a month later. We did extend the due date by a week as we were kind of tracking the progress and we wanted to give everybody a little more time. So we told participants, once a module opens, it will be available through the end of the challenge, but we strongly encouraged our participants to complete the discussions and activities by that weekly due date. You know, we know that life happens and folks are away during the summer, and we created the schedule not to really put on that extra work and stress everyone out, but we wanted those weekly deadlines to help keep the community building aspect of the challenge on track. Now we asked each member of our list team to be responsible for monitoring one week of the challenge. So again, not putting too much burden on our teammates. And we asked them to kind of look through the work and to respond to discussion board posts. Um, so there was engagement. I also tracked the interactions and recorded each interaction on a spreadsheet, mostly to be accountable for awarding prizes at the end of the challenge. Now our curriculum that we created was made to align with Bloom's taxonomy, which is that standard hierarchy of learning and educational objectives. So here you have our basic structure here. Week one covers the most basic level of Bloom's taxonomy, which is understand. And we asked our librarians to articulate their values as teachers. In week two, we covered Bloom's level of apply, and we asked librarians to apply principles of inclusive teaching to their practice. Level three was analyze, and we asked our librarians to analyze their instructional partnerships. Then finally, in week four, we asked librarians to create, and the main focus of that week was to create or write a teaching philosophy. So we had those four modules. We also had one kickoff module just to kind of warm everyone up and prepare them for the format of the challenge. So each module was structured in this order. We started with an introduction to the week's theme. We then gave a very short reading, again, trying to keep the workload light. Then we gave a reflective prompt based around that reading, which the librarians would respond to in our discussion board. Then we asked each librarian to do an activity and we gave a list of options so that the librarian could select what they wanted to do, what they were most interested, interested in, or what they had time to do. We also listed further non-required readings related to the theme in case anyone else was curious. And then because it was important to build that community, we asked each person to respond to at least one other colleague in that discussion board so that it would feel like a conversation. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, walk you through the curriculum. I'm going to paste the link in the chat box. So let me open it up. 
And this is our curriculum. So we're going to just kind of go through it, not in totality, just to um, have you browse through it. But we have licensed this curriculum under a Creative Commons license, which means you are welcome to adapt it. You can use it. You can edit it as you see fit. We just recommend, if you can, to put an open license on it to continue the sharing. So here is what we have. Each section is arranged by, that by each week's module. And I'll start, I'll look at kickoff discussion here. So again, we wanted like something easy to start off with. So we asked everyone to read ACRL's Roles and Strengths of Teaching Librarians. And we just asked in the discussion board, you know, make a list of your skills. What skills are you the strongest in with teaching and what would you like to develop? We asked also, you know, think about the teaching you currently do. What is working well or what do you want to improve upon? So that was just to ease people in. We had a lot of really great discussion in that board. So here I'll take you through uh, module one so you can see again how everything was set up. So week one was at the understand level and we were very clear. We told everyone that this was coming straight from Bloom and we gave a theme. So we were just doing a little introduction to teaching and our required reading was I don't know, maybe a five to seven page article from college and undergraduate libraries talking all about taking on a teaching role. So you can see here that we would take the reflection prompt based on that article. So we asked, um, based on the article, we're talking about teaching persona. Tell us, how were you prepared to teach as a librarian? How did that shape your teaching persona? What kind of support do you need to grow your teaching persona? So that was where we asked for a reflection and then to please comment on one of your colleagues' posts. So then we would offer that activity. And again, we offered a range of activities. So for that week one, you can see our options were, I think, fairly simple. If you attended some kind of webinar or conference about teaching, just post a takeaway about teaching on our discussion board. I think that's where we had a lot of discussion generated. We also offered a list of technology tools and said investigate a technology tool for teaching and post a key takeaway about that technology tool. Or we just said find any other item about teaching, an article, a podcast, a blog post. Doesn't have to be about librarians and teaching, it could just be more general. Post a link to that item and a summary or a key takeaway. So we have that range of options, pick what works for you. And then of course we asked everyone to respond in that discussion board. We, we had one board for that first reflection, so this one right here. Then we had a second board for the activities and any reflection or discussion around the activities. We did not grade any of the work. Instead, we just tracked who participated and what they participated with. So you can certainly go through the rest of the curriculum. You can see it's all set up exactly the same way. You've got your Bloom's level, your theme, your required reading, your reflection discussion prompt, and your range of activities that you can select from. I am realizing now, Caitlin, I didn't add the suggestions for further reading for each module, so I promise you all I will go back and do that later today. <laughs> um, but again, you have all of the levels, so we invite you to take it and use it with your team or to adapt it to however you see fit. All right, let me hop back here. And I wanted to share just a few highlights from those discussion boards. So there's a few screenshots on my slides here, but I'll also summarize some of the other thoughts, just so you could get a sense of what types of conversation that we had in this Canvas site. So in that kickoff discussion, I already mentioned that we asked, you know, what strengths do you have as an instructor? What skills would you like to develop? Or what do you need to refresh in your teaching? So some highlights from that discussion included librarians saying things like, like they were excited at starting the teaching challenge. Um, someone highlighted a strength in empathy. They felt that was really important as a teacher. Um, a lot of people through a lot of posts said that the most, the biggest challenge they have is time, time to prepare and time to like give the actual instruction because we all know those one shots can be a challenge. Um, some people mentioned the importance of instructional design, especially now that there was so much online teaching, they were trying to figure out how to do it better online. 
Someone admitted a pitfall around overthinking instruction, which again, I think a lot of librarians have been there. Um, and we talked about the importance of confidence as an instructor. Now in week one, we talked about that teaching persona and what kind of support do you need to grow it. And our respondents talked about either they had training in library school, but a lot of people said they did not have training in library school and how that affected their career. Others wanted to improve upon faculty relations. Some talked about the challenge of prepping for classes. Um, also mentioned were the ways that this kind of conversation could continue, like People were saying we would really love to have a community of practice or do team teaching so that we could have these conversations more often. Uh, in week two, we asked what is one thing you will commit to doing in your future teaching and or creation of learning materials in order to better reach all learners, because that that discussion was about diversity and accessibility. So our responses included adding cultural context or diversity into library lessons. Many promise to incorporate more mediums to accommodate all types of learners. For example, one specific example was to read aloud the Zoom chat messages because um, maybe people can't read them so easily. Maybe they need to hear it. So just doing simple things like that to be more inclusive. In week three, we asked to share a SWOT analysis, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. A SWOT analysis on your instructional partnerships um, because that was the week where we wanted um, librarians to analyze their faculty relationships. So responses talked about things like the challenges of uh, reaching adjuncts, how it can be difficult to build those relationships with adjunct professors. Um, someone, I think it was actually me, talked about the difficulty of being at a different campus from your faculty and students. My people are on the main campus and I'm not, uh, so that's a difficult relationship. We talked about opportunities though, like joining campus-wide committees and collaborating with faculty in general education courses. So there were opportunities there to build relationships. I'm not sharing with you our week four reflection um, because that was mostly related to writing a teaching philosophy and only a couple of people wrote out a full teaching philosophy and I didn't feel comfortable sharing those comments with you. So it wasn't as many responses because Caitlin will tell you that participation trickled down a bit near the end of the challenge. And with that, I will take it to Caitlin. Go ahead. All right, Thanks, Courtney. So next steps, what are we going to now that we can take a step back, what will we do with what we've learned uh, from our first go at the teaching challenge? So I want to share a little bit about the assessment that we did. So we did survey our participants. We wanted feedback from them on what they had learned and if there were sort of concrete takeaways, ways that they might change their future teaching. So one thing that we got mixed feedback about was on the workload. So we and we had asked about that specifically, particularly because we did see people, there are a lot of people at the beginning and it kind of trickled off toward the end. Um, so some folks said that they thought the workload was appropriate. Others said that it was too much, um, particularly the later weeks, like they started off strong, but then couldn't sort of sustain that level of work throughout an entire month. Um, all of the survey respondents did agree that it helped them to reflect on their teaching. So. We see that as a success. That was one of our main goals was to build in more reflect, reflective practice. So we were happy to make strides toward that. Um, an area where we can improve, the survey indicated not everyone felt that they had connected with their colleagues. So that was another one of our goals. Um, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm about online discussion boards, which is maybe more a shocking revelation. Um, so it seemed like we had kind of missed that connection piece. So something we can work on in the future. Um, and some of the takeaways uh, included things like, Courtney's already mentioned a few of these, things like bringing more accessibility and DEI concepts to your teaching. Um, what I thought was really interesting is uh, someone in their reflection said that sort of one of the issues that they have is really around faculty expectations for instruction. So kind of managing expectations in those um, partnerships. How can you communicate better about kind of what you're going to do, what they're asking for, things like that. Um, other kind of practical takeaways, things like building in additional cues for learners to help them check for understanding and knowledge. So we did see in our survey that um, even though our participation kind of trickled out, people did 
end up learning. They did end up reaching some of the goals and also letting us know some of the areas where we can do better next time. So let's talk a few best practices that Caitlin and I felt came out of this experiment with everyone. So I think you probably know this by now, we've said it a few times, but timing is everything. Um, we would have liked more participation, but we had a few roadblocks. You know, first of all, it was summer when librarians were not actively teaching. So, you know, asking you to reflect on a class that happened a few months ago might have been a little difficult to do. Uh, since it was summer, librarians were also on vacation, so they couldn't fully participate in the challenge. It also, the timing fell that annual reports were due at the end of the month, and there's a lot of paperwork to write for that. And so I think a lot of the trickle off happened because everyone was writing their annual reports. Um, then our second best practice or second big takeaway was to choose the readings intentionally. We made a conscious effort to include works by underrepresented groups of librarians, but in fact, we had to go back and do this better. We, we started with a list of readings and said, this needs to be a bit more diverse. So we had to go look for those. Um, so diversity and inclusion is an important movement in education. And we wanted to do what we were preaching in that level two of the challenge. So choose your readings intentionally. Then number three, you know, vary the modes for interaction, right? Some of the work may have been too much to ask of the librarians, especially that final level where we wanted a one to two page teaching philosophy, which like isn't something we created, right? This is a this is an actual type of statement that a lot of people ask for, um, but it is a lot of work. So consider holding, you know, maybe a workshop to accomplish some of that work, like writing a teaching philosophy. Um, doing a lot of the work solo doesn't build those connections and maybe isn't as appealing, but if we had all gotten together and talked about it, maybe we would have seen more success. So now that you know a little more about our teaching challenge, we hope you take inspiration and accept this teaching challenge at your own institution. And also you can steal our meme if you like this little guy, he's out there on the internet. Um, we're coming to the end. I realize we have a fair amount of time for questions, so we are happy to answer whatever you may want to know about the challenge. We're happy to go back and talk through some of the other levels if that would be of interest. Um, but otherwise, do know that you can reach out to Caitlin and I, and I will make sure I pop in our um, email addresses in the chat box for everyone, but we're happy to share any more knowledge that we have. Let us know. You're welcome. I see a question in the chat. I'll read it. You answer, Caitlin. How many participated? Were they spread out across campuses? That's funny. As I was talking about the assessment, I was like, oh, I didn't make note of the numbers. <laughs> I was like, I, didn't, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, so I, I'm gonna look it up right now. Courtney, do you know off the top of your head? I wanna say we, I probably had my spreadsheet had about 20 librarians on it. And for the first, the kickoff and week one, we probably had like 15 participating. And then, like I said, like each week it was maybe 10 in the second week, like seven in the third week and like three in the fourth week. And some people, so because it was a Canvas course, we had to like enroll people into the course. So we did say, you know, like send us an email to let us know you want to participate. So also at least like seven other people signed up but then never did anything. So I don't know if they saw the challenge and got scared by it or they ran out of time, but there were a few people who just didn't participate even though they signed up for it. And we did have people across campuses. Yeah, there were definitely folks from the, lots of people from the health sciences libraries. We actually have two health sciences libraries a biomedical sort of library and a podiatry library. So people from both of those campuses. Um, we had special collections folks, um, law, the law library. Basically, I would say pretty much all of our teaching librarians participated. That 15-ish number is pretty much everybody who is sort of like has instruction as the main responsibility. So we were pretty pleased with kind of how many people were interested. Um, but yeah, it was maybe a little bit too much work to sustain the whole thing 
uh, with with the big group over time. Any other questions we can answer? Should I, t should I, I should talk about prizes. This is my big thing. Caitlin rolls her eyes every time I talk about prizes. So since we had no money, here, here's our, our level of prizes. If you completed kickoff in week one, we created a sticker um, that we printed on our Cricut machine. So you get a special sticker. Level two, you get a 3D printed Temple T keychain. So that's pretty cool. Level, what's level three? A bookmark, a 3D printed mm -hmm. bookmark. And level four, there was only one person um, and myself. There were two people who completed level four and your prize was going to be a 3D printed nameplate for your desk. So basically we used our makerspace to make all of the prizes. Everyone does love stickers. Melissa, thank you, right? It's great for your laptop, wherever you want to put it. Water bottle, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, you, and hopefully if, now that we've done we've run it once and had some success we can make more of a case uh for getting some additional funding in the future also i think our budget will settle a little bit <laughs> there's not you know as much global pandemic activity happening andy asked do you have any examples of these prizes and they're sitting on my desk, but if you missed the beginning, I was sent home early because we have some severe weather coming in PA. So they're at my desk and I'm at home. Um, how about I will make sure I get some pictures and add them to that teaching challenge curriculum so you can come back and look at our prizes. We did know what the prizes were going to be beforehand. We had talked it out as the, um, the list team. We had brainstormed what would be cool. There is a 3D maker space website and I'm blanking on it. Caitlin, do you remember what it was where you could yeah, get inspiration? Thing Thingiverse. Thingiverse. Oh. Um, so we looked for like models so that we could turn them into whatever we wanted to turn them into. But um, if there, if you have a 3D maker space and you want to know any more about this, I could surely get the models sent to you somehow. So drop me an email and ask for that. We did not tell the participants what the prizes were ahead of time, though. So they did participate. We said there would be prizes. We didn't tell them what they were. So they did participate uh, without knowing specifically what they were. We were partially, I think, just worried about, like, how are we going to get prizes to people? We're working remotely. Um, so just to kind of protect ourselves, we didn't disclose what they were until later. Um, so it was nice that people trusted us uh, enough to, to just go for it without knowing they'd be fabulously rewarded. And, you know, ideally, you know, we know food would have motivated everybody. I think we wished we could have had a kickoff that was a little party and some cake and that sort of thing, but pandemic. So we didn't, we were unable to have that. Um, and there was a question about the curriculum. I did just post the Google Docs link again in the chat. Um, so we openly license that. All you have to do is give us credit. If you use it, you're also free to adapt it. So you should be able to get it at that Google Doc. You, I would have done it for the name places, Andy, right? Thank you, Andy. <laughs> right? It's pretty cool. Anything else we can answer? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming to this presentation. We hope it was very helpful and interesting, and we hope you are able to take your own teaching challenge on. Best of luck. Yeah, yeah definitely. If you think of any questions uh, after today, you know where to find us. Thanks so much for, for coming. Yes, thank you to our presenters. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you to everybody who attended. Um, just as a reminder, the recording will be available on the LIT website after the conference. And we will have a survey that we're going to send out to you to assess our sessions. And we hope you'll take the time to complete that as your feedback is valuable to us. And so we will be back here at three for our next presentation. We'll see you then.